Welcome, everyone. This is John Coleman here today, piggybacking on his very own channel with David Rovex. How are you doing, David? Hey, doing great, John. Thank you. So the uh, the dynamics of StreamYard uh, were such that that it was more fortuitous to use David's channel with all the the fancy gizmos. So I really feel like I'm on I'm on your couch here, David, or something. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, we got like a banner in the bottom here, and that's uh, it's pretty nice. I like it. I like yeah, it. the paint version is spickier. All I got is this uh, this whiteboard sign here. <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> Great. Yeah, I saw that. It says David Rovix on the whiteboard. <laughs> yeah, with the glint of the sun coming in. Yeah, it's good. That's it. That's but the modern the modern ethos for broadcasting is uh, you know having some kind of random background, right? And they're even doing shows on Al Jazeera about the random backgrounds and reading the bookshelves, <laughs> reading all the titles on people's bookshelves, which is usually what people have behind them. You know? So David's uh, familiar to viewers of this series, uh, a conversation with which is on the Apocalypse Stacy's channel on BitChute and YouTube. David's been on actually a couple of times on this series, and most lately, I believe, with uh, Paula, wasn't it, uh, earlier this year? Yeah, talking about the Song News Network project that Paula and I have been involved with for years now. Absolutely. So, David, briefly, can you give us um, just a background of yourself and your work, and then we can hop in to our main topic for this conversation? Uh, oh, and, and Paul is watching too. Um, oh, there we go. She, she just messaged us, but not on a not on a comment board, just in a private message that popped up on my screen. <laughs> but, uh, fancy technology, the distraction, the constant distraction. What was the question? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a singer songwriter. I live in Portland, Oregon, and uh, been involved uh, with some degree of uh, efforts at rent strike mm -hmm. organizing in recent months, and um, I, uh, I I do a lot of blogging and podcasting and and uh, live streaming uh, especially since the pandemic I, I was i was doing some of that before the pandemic i just started doing more of it since so david what is a rent strike in general what is the concept this is going to be very new to a lot of people in this generation and and probably anyone younger than about uh, 60 or 70 years of age what is a rent strike a rent strike is when renters uh, stop paying the rent and uh, in an organized uh, fashion uh, in one, one way or another. Uh, and that can take all kinds of different forms, um, <clears throat> but uh, it, there's it generally and involves, I mean, hopefully if it's going to be successful anyway, it tends to involve a higher degree of mutual aid and organization, uh, you know, of whatever kind of generally of a horizontal nature, uh, but where people are networking with each other so that when there is an eviction uh, ultimately happening or attempted eviction happening, uh, that lots of people gather together and through various different t potential tactical means uh, prevent that eviction from happening. Or if the eviction does happen, they uh, people can uh, bring uh, the belongings that were uh, put out onto the street back into the apartment and uh, change the lock and unevict people. And that's the model that was very prevalent throughout the 1930s uh, to such an extent that uh, they banned evictions in the third biggest city in the country in Chicago. Uh, back during the, the great, the last Great Depression, evictions were banned. You're breaking up a little. I don't know what's happening. Very good. And again, we'll touch on this topic later. But this time, how is it now, David? Oh, uh, it's. I'm just in case Any it's on better? my end. I'm closing all the other stuff I should have closed before that I had open on my computer, and hopefully that will solve it. But <laughs> yeah, it's better now. Yeah. There you go. Um, I guess, and we will touch on this, th this dynamic of organization and of actual community, not just slapping it up on a sign uh, for our towns, but actual community. This is something that is, I think, very unfamiliar to us. So we're going to talk about the difficulties of getting that, um, that cohesion and so forth, especially in an atomized uh, and deliberately atomized society. Yeah, that's a huge challenge. Absolutely. I mean, and one uh, just to say, like the, the 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 general atmosphere among society, I would say the prevalent atmosphere 
in most most of the time is one of defeatism you know whether or not it's it's really recognized as such but for most people uh, the idea of talking about succeeding in a strike of any kind, whether it's a rent strike or any other kind of strike, most people, uh, their attitude in, in this country anyway, at these times, I would say, to, you know, tends, the attitude generally, from my experience, tends to be one of like, oh, it, you're you're just some kind of utopian uh, anarchist, uh, you know, having a pipe dream. And, you know, yes, it might be nice if society were not organized this way, but this is just how it is. You, you just got to deal with it, you know. But actually, society can be totally different. And it, it, we have the benefit of ha living in a world that has like almost 200 countries in it or whatever it is. And, and they're not all the same. And in fact, there's really big differences from one to the next. And there are lots of societies where re housing is still actually very affordable. And, and it doesn't need to be the way it is in the US. David, on my shelf beneath the plastic, delicious looking plastic sandwich there um, is a book, uh, Famine, by uh, Liam O'Flannery, uh, which is a, a book from Irish uh, literature in the 20th century. And kind of background reading for uh, today is that the landlord features prominently in the, in the mm. topic. Can we, um, can you highlight for us some significant rent strikes in the past? Well, actually, speaking of Ireland, the, the the rent strike at the beginning of the twentieth century in Roscommon is was a, is a fascinating and and really powerful example that ended up having a profound impact on uh, the colonial rule, on uh, the whole land question, on the law under British colonialism at the time. Uh, it really was a massive uh, event uh, that took place over the course of years. It was highly organized. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, U.S. Uh, history, the the the, uh, the Chicago rents the the Chicago rent strikes and 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 the, and the and the whole like you know not necessarily uh, it, it's not necessarily that that there has to be an organized rent strikes going on as much as an organized uh, council of unemployed uh, or or some other such structure. But back in the 30s, it was the unemployed workers councils, and uh, it, when you know that when a landlord knows that a forced eviction is quite likely going to be faced with thousands of militant unemployed workers who are going to oppose the uh, attempt eviction and are going to then uh, it carry the evicted tenants uh, belongings back into the apartment and have professional locksmiths change the locks anyway if you know if that's going to happen anyway and, and the, then they're going to require thousands of police to attempt to do this eviction which may just fail anyway you know that's the kind of prospect uh, that the landlords in, in in the United States and the big cities in the US were looking at back in the 30s and and that has an impact uh, on on their policies, uh, you know, in terms of eviction. And in the case of Chicago, it meant a uh, an actual legal banning on uh, evictions procedure, procedures. And of course, th there are lots of countries where forced evictions are just illegal in the first place, and where even if there are landlords uh, and and there are these kinds of like private landlord tenant relationship without uh, a lot of uh, legal rights for tenants or rent control or anything like that, um, you know. And, and of course, in most in many countries, there are much better laws than we have on those on those things. But uh, even if they uh, have a, don't have a great rent control laws, they still have a uh, ban on forced evictions in many countries, and this has a profound impact on on the whole relationship between landlords and tenants and what landlords uh, have recourse to you know and so, so it, it forces them to be to, to have to communicate uh, and and negotiate and not, and they don't have this kind of absolute power that they uh, you know really appear to have in any society where forced evictions are legal you know but but i think uh the, the rent strike uh, that i um i guess maybe there's so many examples, and I'm not even familiar with most of them. I'm sure I, I've, I've, I've only heard of them, and you know, not don't have exhaustive knowledge on all the different rent strikes. It, luckily, you know, there's been so many of them that it's really you'd have to be quite a scholar to to be keeping track of all the ones that have happened, including even just keeping track of all the successful ones. But in in uh, in your neck of the woods, there in the northeast of the country, um, the uh, rent strike that that perhaps was like most uh, interesting both because of the scale of it as well as the sort of uh, romantic ideals behind it too 
uh, was the up in upstate New York uh, centered around Rensselaer when the richest family in the world at the time, the Rensselaer family, who owned very large swathes of upstate New York on both sides of the Hudson River, where their tenants uh, who were farmers. And, and of course, because of uh, because of the kinds of land reforms that the you know, the Homestead Acts and various other things that happened as a result of that rent strike. Uh, many of us today are unfamiliar even with the concept of tenant farmers or sharecroppers, but mm -hmm. tenant tenant farmers and sharecroppers were a very prevalent thing all over the country uh, back then, uh, as of course was slavery. Uh, but uh, the tenant farmers of upstate New York uh, rebelled and they stopped paying the rent in huge numbers. And uh, they, through mutual aid, uh, they prevented evictions from happening for nine years and they ultimately won the, they got the land, uh, the, you know, they had to pay for it, but they, they, they were no longer tenants and they were able to buy their land and, and get out from under this, uh, this perpetual, you know, sort of modern, not very modern form of peasantry. Really. It's no, not modern at all. It's just, it was just a continuation of feudalism. I think someone made a song about that. If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> I were hearing such a thing. I have written at least two dozen songs on this on, on related subjects, including one about that particular rent strike, yes, called Landlord. So David, prior to uh, the shutdowns, which we'll talk about, which provide, I, I suppose, the um, the immediate background to the, the uh, Portland uh, rent strike, uh, prior to that, uh, maybe taking it from the, the so-called Great Recession the past 10 years or so up until the beginning of this year, what were the dynamics for renters, for families, and uh, for working class sorts um, in the position of renting, which is oftentimes the only option available to people? You know, I think um, it's been such a such a jagged evolution over the course of a very long period of time. And as I, I was just talking with Bill Weinberg, uh, an activist and writer, a journalist in New York City, who who was uh, around um, as a young man in the Tompkins Square Park uh, movement in the Lower East Side, around the whole, all the squats and the movement against gentrification there. And I mean, you know, you, you can you can trace the timeline back to anywhere that you want to, and 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 uh, you know, it's kind of hard to know where to begin. But in terms of modern times, like in the past twenty years or so, uh, I mean. Although there was a huge problem with stratification of wealth and poverty and homelessness in the 1990s uh, and before the 1990s, uh, it was like night and day in terms of uh, affordability of housing in the 90s compared to what happened after the great financial collapse of uh, 2008, you know, the banking collapse and the bailout. What happened after that? What I lived through it, so I was kind of like not really understanding what was going on or, or why it was happening until very recently when I've started to get a handle on what's been going on over the past 12 years. But what's been happening is this this out, this out massive consolidation of uh, the, of, of how housing and, and fin financialization of the housing market and investment in housing as a main form of investment, the most profitable form of investment for capitalists, not only from all around the United States, but from around the world. I mean, many of the capitalists who invest in the U.S. housing market are not even from the United States. There's a lot of Norwegian uh, capitalists. They have trillions of dollars in, in the uh, Norwegian, you know, that nice uh, social democracy in Norway. Uh, you know, they have trillions of dollars in this oil fund and they use it uh, in all sorts of unethical ways. Uh, they may have divested from some really outrageously un unethical forms of investment, but they still invest in the U.S. and British housing markets, which is a totally unethical investment if you ask me and uh, it's uh, it's a it's de what what's what's developed is a situation that is uh, I think has created a greater degree of inequality in this country than at any time since the age of the robber barons we have to go way back before the Great Depression to get to a time when there's this, been this much stratification of wealth and so much of that has to do with the uh, financialization of the housing market that's taken place over the past 12 years and the consolidation of of the market and i mean people have wages have not gone up uh <clears throat> real wages have not gone up but people work more and more jobs and of course the rents uh, keep on going up and here in portland uh, this is the most rent burdened uh, city in the country in terms of how much people make relative to how much they pay in rent 
You know, that's interesting because I think we've all felt these these dynamics for the past while that you mentioned here, the real wage is not going up, uh, the rent certainly going up and this sort of thing. And, you know, in, <laughs> in what is, is increasingly turning into an open, open air madhouse in 2020 here, um, I can't imagine as we turn our attention, my question being um, the situation for renters right now with the disruption of work and so forth. But just to uh, soliloquize, um, I can't imagine not how how chaotic this must be, this situation now, not having a certain grasp on history and on social dynamics and political dynamics, you know, a lot it, without having a little bit of knowledge of of history and and those other things. I really it must really be something else if you if you know you were someone who was just binge watching this, that, and the other for the past twenty years. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if you if you don't uh, if you can't put this into context, uh, it becomes that much more overwhelming. And even when you are into history and when you are a news junkie, even in normal times like me uh, or you, uh, just trying to process what's happening right now, uh, you know, without even trying to interpret what's happening but just to, to, to understand the the depth of it you know and the breadth of i mean it's uh it's really overwhelming and if it's overwhelming for people like you and me uh then um uh, yeah i can only imagine how much more difficult it must be for people who have not been obsessed with history and politics for their whole adult lives you know it's it's uh you know those people are out there and i i I, I, this is why I started uh, after the pandemic. It, my inclination was to start broadcasting five days a week and interviewing my friends who who have a lot of perspective on different mm -hmm. uh, things, uh, but partly just to deal with my own mental health issues and have some connection with other adults because I have three kids, none of whom are in school, and I don't really talk to adults much other than my wife. So, I, you know, when I'm on tour, I do, but when I'm not touring, I, I just thought, okay, well, I, I can talk to people. But the, the main reason other than my own, you know, other than self-therapy, it was to... Uh, try to share some knowledge with other people out there who are also groping around trying to figure out what's happening. You know, I don't know how much, how many of them are looking at my YouTube channel for, for answers, but those who are, hopefully there's some there. Mm -hmm. Now uh, you can further uh, comment on the psychic stresses of this moment, but also getting back to just the financial dynamic of renters. Um, what are we facing David with these, um, uh, obviously, work stoppages. Uh, something else I'll bring to your attention. It, it looks very clear to me, at least, that uh, grade school is at least going to be disrupted, which means parents are going to have an obligation uh, to be, you know, to not go off to work if they have to get their kid onto Zoom at whatever o'clock in the morning, right? So there's yeah. these stresses on top of the psychic stuff you brought up, mental stuff. So, um, what is the situation of renters right now? Well, the um, <clears throat> the business press. Which, as I mean, Noam Chomsky has commented before that if you want to really understand what's happening uh, in 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 the country, uh, sometimes you you get much better uh, better information from the business press than you do from the regular uh, you know mass uh, propaganda kind of uh, corporate media because the business press they have uh, people who really depend on understanding what's happening for their uh, success. Or lack of success for their investments, you know. So they 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 have less leeway to be dishonest and propagandistic, and and they have been raising the alarm for months now. Uh, you know that ever since the first bailout, the first multi-trillion-dollar bailout, that uh, that was uh, not enough. It was misdirected, and we need a lot more of it. And they've all been saying that, uh, which is just you know quite something that kind of unanimity and now what they're all saying is and that the numbers uh, the estimates uh, differ but the num but they're talking about somewhere between 20 to 28 million evictions are going to take place between now and so the end of September if uh if if things if the trajectory continues on as it is if, like if the pandemic extra pandemic unemployment assistance uh, actually expires at the end of this month without being renewed and you know other factors if the suspensions on evictions are not uh, continued and if there is no rent relief etc if things continue as they are uh, we're looking at tens of millions of evictions or at least attempted evictions so that's uh, an extremely dire situation and under such circumstances the idea that things are just going to go uh, as the landlords and the, and the police and the politicians might 
you know, think they're going to go just because the law says, you know, okay, now you're going to get evicted. That doesn't mean it's going to really happen. You know, uh, I mean, the, basically the whole capitalist system is, is breaking down in front of our eyes. I mean, school in the first place was uh, they, the reason why we have uh, mandatory universal education and the reason why that, you know, as many other people <laughs> watching, you know, hopefully know that this this dates back to the Industrial Revolution. It's not and that's not a coincidence. And uh, it, it uh, we needed places to put the kids uh, while the parents are working. So you know, once people were not working on farms anymore and you know, most or you know, more and more people were moving to cities and not working on farms, uh, they needed needed to be able to do something with their children. And mm -hmm. this is why a mandatory public education or some form of public education happened in all the industrialized countries around the same time. You know, it wasn't just like they all had the good idea at the same time. They have, you know, they had to have something to do with something to do with the children. And now uh, that's all fallen apart with so-called home learning, which I think for anybody, you know, younger than high school age, it's a ridiculous prospect because even for high school, but any, especially younger kids, you know, they need each other. They need community. They need a little, you know, kids, people are tribal animals. We need community. You know, we, we don't function sitting in a room by ourselves with a screen very well. It, it causes anxiety, depression, and suicide. You know, this is no way to run a school system, but, uh, uh you know, of course we have a pandemic. So obviously, you know, people, we, we got to get creative about these things, but uh, to call it home learning is just a, a, a crazy even phrase in the first place. And that can only be used by people who don't understand what elementary school is all about when it's done well in the first place, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it is a warehousing school. I mean, school can be good. I think school can be very good for a lot for kids. It can be very good for kids in many different ways. And I'm, I'm a big believer in society and in, and in, you know, so societal structures like schools when they're done well. Um, but uh, this idea of, you know, learning on Zoom and and uh, and the idea of the parents uh, all working from home. I mean, it's just it's preposterous. Even if you can work from home, uh, even if you have the kind of job where you can work from home, the idea of working from home while your children are not in school is child abuse. Plain and simple. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's that's my big fear is. Well, my 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 fear is that. Um, that parents, that this is not the fear. The fear, people have recognized how obnoxious the modern schools are. They have a cer certain, uh, there's a certain popularization of the observation you made, David, of the industrial or the economical uses of, of um, schools basically to warehouse kids for, for a certain number of years. And that's explicitly the case with with American high schools, by the way, after World War II. That was, that was uh, you could read a book called... Um, the rise and fall of the American teenager by Thomas Hine. He gets into that. Um, but people have this observation and is one, obviously the past six years of my life, I obviously agree with that the mainstream schools are obnoxious and are largely a waste of time and certainly money. But my fear is that everyone is going to, is going to run onto these online platforms and think they're getting the same thing. And they're going to completely lose the real magic of what the schoolroom can be. Yeah, that's but that's that that is the prospect, right? For so many uh, of uh, for so much of the things that are moving online. I mean, there there are some, you know, pros and cons to doing things online, and it's not all negative. There's a lot of community to be found out there, especially if you're isolated and quarantined anyway, you know, that's, uh, you know, what, but, but, but you have to be in that situation. It only becomes like romantic, all this online stuff when you're in that kind of situation. Like if you imagine, I don't know, in what is it, the, in Z nation in that movie and, and, and no, is it, what is it? The zombie series or Z, I think it was Z nation. There's the guy in the Arctic who is, who's got no friends other than his dog. And he's like the last person left, you know, up there running this like sort of radio station. And, or and the fact that he can, kind of look through his lens of his radio station and and have some kind of contact with other parts of the world where people are alive and fighting the zombies i mean that makes it it make, it's romantic but it's only romantic because he's so isolated you know and sure. but nobody wants to be isolated like that or or they shouldn't want to be i don't think and i mean maybe some people do and that's fine if it's good for you if if you got that kind of uh you know, whatever you got going on that you need to be isolated and, and that's good. You know, that's great that it's good for some people, but for most people, it, it's 
not a healthy thing and and it's uh, it's not a good alternative to real human interaction and it's also really scary and fascistic potentially depending mm -hmm. on who's running things it's potentially like so i mean when you consider the way the internet is now i mean this is not the internet of 1995 much as i wish it were it's uh this is the internet of facebook google and uh spotify and you know this is the internet that is now totally dominated by corporations and the idea of uh, getting away from them is is uh and and sort of creating different structures is i think uh, increasingly just a pipe dream you know because it's like trying to encourage people to ride bicycles when there's a super highway that you can ride on for free except for the advertising you know who's going to avoid riding on the superhighway if the only thing uh, that they you know have to deal with is the billboards? You know they're going to take it because the bicycle is a hell of a lot slower. And, you know it's a lot more work, and and there's nobody else riding. And you know, I mean, uh, there, once you build a superhighway, people are going to use it, and that's going to be true of Google, Spotify, Facebook, and then many other platforms. And they they make sure that's the case by doing things in such a way that destroys the rest of the platforms and undermines the, the ability of all the other platforms to exist the way Spotify has totally destroyed the music industry. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's, uh, it's, it's a terrifying uh, situation now. Well, we'll return to the larger uh, possibilities uh, with this pandemic uh, a little bit later, David, but let's get to the real having set up very well the the situation here with rent and and so forth let's talk about the specifically the portland rent strike and uh perhaps you can uh inform us who are not in in uh washington what is pdx oh P pdx well it's in oregon right and it's uh portland okay. it's just the it's just the acronym the uh, three-letter code for the portland airport and it has been for a very long time. Portland has had an airport since um, I can't remember when, but you know, 80 years or something. There's been some kind of an airport here. So, so when yeah. you hear the strike called the PDX strike for the viewers, they're talking about Portland, uh, Oregon. So totally. And they're just talking about the port, the rent strike in Portland, which is not like a, it doesn't have a, I mean, there is no such thing I would say as PDX rent strike. It's just a, it's just what people in Portland who are rent striking are, uh, you know, can be collected under that uh, name because they're in Portland, but it's not to be inferring that this is an organization or something. It's not as far as I know, it's just that there, there is uh, quite a bit of uh, rent strike uh, activity and talk about a rent strike going on here. But really it should be said that uh, when we're talking about a rent strike in Portland, it's a, it's a practice rent strike. It's a, it's a play. Uh, it's a rehearsal for a rent strike. The real rent strike uh, happens when the suspension on evictions is lifted. Uh, you know, it's, it's only when you face eviction that you're really uh Rent striking in the sense that we understand uh, the, the concept in, in in the U.S. I would say it's it's uh, and and people are not actually facing eviction until the end of September. Although lots and lots of people who, whether or not they fully realize the, this fact, uh, they're moving out of their places all over the place, and 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 they either they don't know there's a suspension on evictions or they know it, it it exists but they are afraid to go into debt for some reason or you know whatever it is uh yeah. or in many cases uh they're they're a roommate with somebody else who they share an apartment and one of them can afford to pay the rent and the other can't and so because of peer pressure the one who can't afford to pay uh basically is as uh, moves out not not necessarily forced to move out but they move out because uh their roommates are not comfortable with only some of them paying the rent i mean there's been not a lot of that going on but for you know one reason multiple reasons people are moving out of their apartments and um but other people are staying and uh, according to the, I mean, the national business press again is talking about, uh, I think one out of three people in the U.S. Uh, did not pay either the rent or their mortgage last month. Mm -hmm. So the uh, situation is is uh, so, so radically much worse than it ever has been since the last Great Depression. I mean, 2008 is not a relevant comparison at this point. This is way, way beyond anything. I mean, in 2008, it took years uh, it took years for um, the the uh, sort of process to that we're, we're the, the kind of process we're talking about taking a few months uh, uh, took years and it wasn't as extreme, not nearly as extreme as this.
David, can you define the difference for us between an eviction moratorium and a rent freeze, or can you define those terms in general? Oh yeah, an eviction moratorium is like whatever, or a, a suspension on evictions is whatever the whatever you might be paying in rent, whether it's high or low, uh, whether it's just gone up or not. Uh, the, the government has declared that nobody can force you to move or to force you to to you know, leave your apartment. That's an eviction moratorium, uh, and and it ends whenever the moratorium ends, and then evictions are once again allowed. And of course, in what form they're allowed depends on what kind of laws might or might not exist in your uh, locality. But uh, a, a rent freeze is when uh, the state, uh, and it has to be, at least in this state, it has to be the state. It's not something that municipalities are even allowed to do uh, because of the way the state law works. Because in 48 out of 50 states in this country uh, got rid of rent control laws on a statewide basis, despite the fact that they were very par popular uh, in in cities, uh, they uh, you know, groups like APEC, uh, groups like the you know these these far right uh, neoliberal groups have since the '80s been buying off state legislatures, uh, very much including our you know state legislature here in Oregon, uh, and many of the state legislatures are full of uh, millionaire landlords. And, and Democrats and Republicans, you know, but they're they're full of uh, millionaires and landlords uh, and millionaire landlords. They, these things tend to go together, and uh, and they rule on behalf of the other landlords. And sometimes they rule uh, on behalf of tenants when they have to or when they feel like uh, society is going to fall apart if they don't do something, or or they're facing uh, the prospect of losing the next election. But usually, it's here. It's not a problem because the Democrats have everything wrapped up and and. Uh, and they still uh, got rid of rent control decades ago, and they never uh, reinstate it. Uh, and it's only recently that rent control has been even talked about by these uh, landlord senators in Salem as of as even a uh, something to even discuss. It's always still it's still even many progressives in this country are still deluded enough about uh, the reality of the situation to talk about. Uh, relaxing uh, de uh, development laws as the solution that we need to build our way out of this problem. And, and it's just, I mean, it's just a, a preposterous idea that we need to turn every city into Los Angeles or Houston or Phoenix in order for housing to be affordable. It's a preposterous idea. It's totally, completely, it's a capitalist uh, you know, it's a, it's a sign of capitalist brain, successful brainwashing. You know, there, there, there's no need uh, to turn everywhere into Houston or Phoenix. You, you can do much better than that. You can have uh, Gothenburg or Malmo or Copenhagen or Berlin instead. And, you know, much, much more livable uh, cities yeah. uh, where the rent is, is uh, in, in many cases, I mean, it's not, not universally, but where you can still find uh, in many cases much, much more affordable housing than uh, what you can find in Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, New York, or any number of other uh, you know, outrageously expensive cities in this country where we have, you know, the streets lined with tents and people living in them. I'm going to lay something out here and it'll be relevant to the next question, David, as well as something we'll bring up towards the end. And that's kind of a historical um, uh, vantage that I see at least. And, and I'd like you to comment on it as the question specifically is what has been the reception that this uh, strike or preparations for a strike um, have received? So I'll reiterate that question. But the vista that I see really for the last 150, 200 years is increasingly in the West is people's actual democratic ability and willingness and, and even consciousness to organize, to push back against social structures, political structures, legal structures. It's been ebbing away. It's been ebbing away. I, I, I remember telling somebody this um, in March when the, you know, when the, when the first lockdown, which is a prison term, by the way, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. the first down came, um, you know, I was kind of, not to be taken literally, but I was kind of bummed out there weren't any any red revolutions going on in the world. Because a hundred years ago, there would have been, with, with this sort of a disruption, the, the people, it doesn't have to be necessarily communist, it could be any, there was no, no pushback, no assertion of any type of, uh, we kind of got that, I guess, with with uh, Chad or whatever it was, but... Um, 
but yeah, the, there's been, I mean, some in Serbia, I guess, and also, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, pushback from the far, from from the right wing and and the Fox uh, listeners. Uh, but yeah, no, because of course the lockdown that's been happening has been a result of a of a actual uh, real pandemic. So so it's not like a, a lockdown because they are worried about a uprising and they want to put us all in our homes so we don't rebel, you know. And they were so worried about rebellion after they uh, it shut down the economy and locked everybody into their houses that that uh, the it, you know most of the countries that could afford to uh, spent a massive amount of money on on uh, actually keeping at least large parts of their population from going hungry, like in the United States, where we did get, I mean, it's been so badly administered and, and so much corruption involved with the administration of it, but there has been quite a lot of aid uh, that has actually reached uh, large segments of the working class in this country, which is why it, mo many people who are actually paying the rent and eating right now, it's because of that uh, aid. And that aid is going to end uh, at some point, probably, uh, it, you know, if we don't uh, follow like the Scandinavian model, which it seems like we're not going to be following, or the, even the Canadian model, where they have universal basic income now uh, during the pandemic, $2,000 a month everybody gets in Canada, you know, for paying their expenses during the course, of, whether they're working or not, you know, during the course of the pandemic. You know, we need something like that here, but it, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's yeah. Who knows what's going to happen with that? But it, I, I think, to the extent that people have cooperated with the lockdown, it's because they believe in the reality of pandemics. You know, and yes, and and just to con just to conclude with my historical um, idea of things, it's whether it, whether or not it's a physical force. Um, you know, revolution, like in the sense of a hundred years ago, but just in general, following the trajectory of things, labor unions have largely been defanged. People have don't even have much interest in in um, the labor topic any longer. We've been atomized in so many ways, um, and that's all as a background. If you agree with the background, just overall. Um, to the question I have, which is how has been the, the preparation or just the idea of a rent strike been received in your neck of the woods? Yeah, I think, um, well, I mean, of course, things are changing so much in terms of how ideas are received. And now it's becoming uh, surprisingly mainstream to talk about rent strikes, uh, to talk about uh, deferring mortgages, to talk about uh, canceling rent, uh, to talk about government involvement with regulating uh, the cost of housing. Uh, you know, to talk about defunding the police uh, here in Oregon, uh, the legislature is now talking about decriminalizing all drugs. I mean, these are actually, uh, you know, these are radical conversations that have become really mainstream. And uh, whether all, all these things or any of these things or, or you know, to whatever degree uh, these things are implemented, the conversation is now mainstream. But uh, but what is uh, less mainstream is when you get into the specifics. Like what I find is uh, uh, it's very popular to talk about uh, housing should be affordable uh, and uh, to talk about, uh, you know, women should be able to walk the streets safely and police shouldn't be killing uh, black people uh, for existing. You know, this, these, these kinds of uh, things are mainstream uh, popular beliefs that black lives matter and that, that women should be believed and, you know, all kinds of uh, things that were a lot uh, more fringe beliefs uh, just a few years ago, perhaps. But where uh, the conversation gets much stickier is when uh, you start talking about actual concrete implementation. Like, so if Black Lives Matter or if uh, single women uh, trying to raise children on their own uh, from any background matter, you know, to take a couple of examples of, of so, where so much of the poverty in this country is, you know, single mothers and, and Black families and uh you know, the hungry children in this country, who are they? You know, one out of four currently going to bed hungry. Where, who, who, where, you know, and what can be done? You know, the, the city of Portland, uh, is, uh, as was just reported in the mainstream press quite recently, just a few days ago, the average rent in the city of Portland is unaffordable for the average black family in this country. So, uh, you know, the average two bedroom apartment would not be affordable for the average black family on their income in this country. And so if, Black Lives Matter, then 
housing needs to be affordable for black families. You know, that's an obvious conclusion, an obvious connection. But once you start making those connections, you know, if you start putting up anything about rent strikes or anything about uh, affordable housing and how that can be implemented or anything about landlords, uh, you will be called a class warrior. And you, you, know, you will, if you put up physical flyers on the telephone poles around here, they will be taken down really quick. But if you put up stuff about George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, uh, et cetera, any kind of issue that is perceived as vague enough or social enough to be uh, popular, uh, then, uh, then yeah, people can go around with Black Lives Lives Matter bumper stickers and put it, put their lawn, the signs in their lawns, uh, and and nobody's going to bother those uh, signs or those bumper stickers. But you know, it, it, you talk about anything practical, uh, it, you know, what you're going to do about the Black Lives Mattering, you know, then it becomes much more controversial, and it's definitely, you know, the 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 line coming from the actually, you know. Uh, you know, from from the bourgeoisie, from the from the the land owning, uh, large land owning class that you know they love to uh, pretend they're speaking up for the mom and pop landlords because they know nobody cares about uh, the the ones who own hundreds of buildings. But it's these are the landlords that are the main driver of the uh, of the poverty and the immiseration of so much of the population. And uh, you know they uh, they're all talk, but when it comes to actually anything uh, real, then uh, clearly they are the enemy enemy of, uh, of, of, of society. And on your channel, David, I've seen a few uh, experiments you've done with a, with a staple gun and so forth around town. And, um, and you found that to be the case, the, the posters don't last long. Is that it? Yeah, absolutely. That absolutely, and I and I often do it where I put up a, a poster that says uh, uh, talks about uh, uh, Portland emergency eviction response and or organizing this uh, eviction response uh, group uh, for people that want to uh, do that. And I think it's a fairly non-threatening idea for most people and, uh, and, and a good idea, uh, most people would say. But if you put up that uh, poster in front of a large apartment complex, uh, it, it's not that it's taken down necessarily by people who think it's a bad idea. It's taken down uh, because property managers and landlords, uh, you know, call the city and the city responds and and comes and takes the stuff down. But other stuff, uh, other other uh, p posters that people put up on telephone poles of a more artistic nature or that are talking about social issues that are less uh, concrete, uh, you know, and more vague uh, kind of nice ideas about peace and, and uh, brotherly love and, and everything else. That stuff can stay up. Uh, for months, it stays up until the rain has totally worn it down, uh, and, it, and it falls off under the weight of of the decomposition. You know, my posters never have a chance to decompose. David, on the Portland uh, PDX rent strike, they have an interesting um, expression there. I'd like you to uh, to speak to just in, in terms of language usage, and that is um, not homeless, but rather houseless. And what might be the um, the thinking behind that use of, of terminology? It's um, I, I don't think it's that widespread yet, but it's definitely not just limited to Portland. Um, and uh, and and also the PDX rent strike uh, Facebook page is is just you know people who are doing this thing. It has, I mean, I'm not related to this uh, Facebook page. Just incidentally, you know, it's just PDX is the city. And so if some people put up a web uh, Facebook page that says PDX rent strike, that doesn't mean it's an organization. It just means it's it's somebody's rent strike Facebook page on, and they like, happen I, to be in Portland. But yeah, but uh, the. Um, uh, the term, I think, houseless has become uh, common to use the term uh, because we're, I, I think, because many people who are, who are living outside uh, were uh, not comfortable with the term homeless uh, because uh, they have somewhere to live. And so it's a home, whether it's a uh, house or a tent, you know, so houseless is more accurate in terms of their uh, position in life because, uh, you know, a tent uh, may be construed to be a home. It's just not uh, necessarily the home they're looking for. Uh, and I think that the term houseless also has just become common to, uh, to use because with terminology, it, sometimes it's important just to, just to switch it up 
because uh, the, the term uh, homeless uh, is sort of became, becomes this kind of term like uh, like when people sometimes say homeless people, it's like one word. It's like a class of human, you know, the way that the term gets used in some circles of societies as society. And it's uh, it, it starts becoming sort of dehumanized, uh, removed from uh, the reality that these are human beings uh, who have nowhere to live. Uh, you know, much the same way, I think, that, uh, that we, we don't use the term when we're talking about uh, history, uh, uh, we... we, we are much more commonly using the term uh, enslaved person rather than slave, you know, because uh, when we're talking about the history of slavery, uh, you know, slave, it's like, uh, well, it, it became a term that was uh, sort of just another way to dehumanize uh, pe enslaved people. You know, uh, rather than to talk about this, these are human beings who have been enslaved. So it's just, it's a, it, it may seem to be semantical, and really it is uh, semantics, but it's also, you know, there's a reason why uh, semantics, uh, you know, people talk about it because, you know, these, these words become uh, sort of, uh, they lose their meaning when they're used too much. And so sometimes it's important, I think, just to use a different word just to remind people of what we're actually talking about. David, you've brushed up on this a couple of times in your responses, um, but specifically, what has been um, the the reaction uh, of of uh, landlords and including corporate landlords who who seem to be the biggest troublemakers, as well as state agents, state bureaucrats, and so forth, uh, just in the press or in your own um, um, interactions or those you know, um, with the concept of a rent strike? Has there been any um, any threats, any uh, reception or whatnot? I mean, until recently, uh, it was just uh, it never talked about. And even rent control was never talked about as a uh, practical thing. And anyone talking about either rent control or rent strikes uh, were uh, marginalized if they were ever mentioned in uh, the press or by uh, this supposedly progressive politicians either. You know, and it's a revolving door uh, between uh, the corporate landlords, uh, the uh, senators in the state legislatures, uh, the city councilors in most cities. Uh, and um, the corporate media. This is just a big revolving door. It's just a big, uh, you know, old boys club basically that now lets in a few women. Uh, you know, it's um, it's uh, that, that's how it's been uh, all over the country until recently. And um, uh, but in the past few months, uh, with the pandemic, uh, things are changing because they have to, or or at least uh, those all those elements uh, that used to not even want to talk about any of these things uh, as you know rent strikes or or rent control as a viable option or any kind of a way forward, uh, they're now talking about it because they're terrified, uh, not because they care, you know. Uh, I mean, maybe some of them care about us, but if they cared about us in the first place, then they would never have been bought by the landlord. I mean, like if the senators and uh, the legislators in places like Salem, Oregon, or Albany, New York, if they actually cared, or Hartford, Connecticut, if they actually cared about the population, about the working class, uh, then they never would have allowed rent control to end. They never would have uh, passed all this pro-development uh, uh, legislation. Uh, they, you know, they never would have um, taken the power away from municipalities to determine uh, things like rent control in their own municipalities, which is, as people may not know, that in 48 out of 50 states, municipalities do not have the right legally to pass any kind of rent control legislation. They do not have the power to do that. They can only beat around the bush and do things like, try to do things like pass a uh, moratorium on evictions, or they can defund the police who are the ones enforcing evictions. They may be able to do things like that. Uh, they may be able to, uh, you know, decriminalize uh, the non-payment of rent, or, you know, there's ways they can get around it, but they can't actually control uh, what the landlords charge in rent legally under state law. And if they try to do that, they're going to be challenged in the courts and they're going to probably lose because the states in 48 out of 50 cases in this country, everywhere aside from New York and California, which found other ways to get around the problem of 
tenants rights uh you know they all passed uh, legislation that uh banned rent control on a municipal level and on in, uh, and in this on the statewide level you know and they did it you know specifically because it was popular locally so these politicians are not progressive in the first place um and they uh whether they're democrats or republicans they're ruling on behalf of the landlord class and they've made that very clear for many decades now and uh, the fact that they're now talking about rent control is is not because they've changed their minds on uh, on on caring about the working class and and ruling on behalf not ruling on behalf of the capitalists. It's because they're worried about whether society is going to completely fall apart, uh, whether uh, it, they can maintain what they call domestic tranquility, which means a, a atmosphere conducive to business and making money. You know, which riots are not. You know, so if if we have um, you know if we have people uh, smashing all the windows downtown every night, uh, then that um, tends to uh, get in the way of business and, and tends to uh, make them think that maybe if they actually start evicting tens of millions of people, all these people are already smashing up downtown every night might grow in number and uh, make the city even less governable, uh, which I think would be a, a, a very appropriate response to uh, any kind of wave of evictions. Mm. David, before we conclude on some uh, abstract uh, topics about this particular and peculiar situation, can you um, flesh out for us a term you used in passing, but I think um, one which is, is uh, quite interesting, the idea of the mom and pop landlorder, and in particular, how they've been employed by the media and commercials and as... Um, um, uh, a, a type of um, you know puppet to hold up. So as compared to you know the the corporate sort. Yeah, I wrote an essay recently in Counterpunch called uh, "Rich Peasants, Poor Peasants, and Mom and Pop Landlords," and I think um, the the concept of the mom and pop landlord is an important one to explore because it's used so much uh, by the corporate landlords because they don't want to uh, you know they don't want to defend their own interests because uh, they're millionaires or or in some cases billionaires and uh, they um, nobody is sympathetic with them and and you know they're they are raising the rent as much as they possibly can in order to make as much money as they possibly can, just like they are destroying the forests in this state. Uh, for uh, to, to bring up another uh, example of what these uh, finance investors do, you know, they, they run logging companies too, but the logging companies have no interest in long-term uh, sustainability or in existing in 20 years. So what they're doing is what they call liquidating their assets. They're just going around tearing down every private owned a uh, bit of forest land in the state and chipping everything because they're going to cut down all the forests and then they're going to sell uh, the land as real estate uh, and then try to make money in the real estate market once they've destroyed the forests. This is what the same companies uh, are doing who are owning uh, so many of the buildings up and down the coast. So they're in so many different ways. They are they are ruling on behalf of of the rich, uh, of the of the you know, against uh, the climate, against nature, uh, capitalism is is destroying, uh, you know, society and destroying the very planet, uh, you know, in, in its very structure, this whole uh, financialization of the real estate uh, market, you can see what it's doing to society, to the forests, it's just a complete and utter disaster, it is totally disaster, but they, they hide their PR companies, hide behind this fig leaf and their PR companies for all these corporations, they say black lives matter. It's the most outrageous thing to hear millionaires saying black lives matter, because if they actually cared about black lives, they wouldn't be millionaires. But um, the, uh, you know, they would have done something else with their money other than, uh, other than you know, paying their workers uh, low wages and making as much money as they can off of real estate or whatever else they've done to, to make their million. In most cases, of course, they inherited their money anyway. So, but it's a, uh, you know the structure is the the structure is the problem more than the individual capitals. I'm not necessarily trying to blame each capitalist for the problem that we're you know of of the the state of society, but the, in any case, their PR firms you know use uh, like to talk about th that they care about uh, you know all these uh, marginalized people in society, which is obvious you know 
total garbage that they don't they don't care at all but uh this is how and they of course they they taught one of the, the the people in society they care most about is the mom and pop landlords because then they can get some sympathy from the people who are like uh, like say my you know my sister who, who has a it lives in a in a place uh, where there's three apartments uh, you know her her apartment or my mother and then then the, uh, the renter it's uh, and, and uh, you know this is the kind of uh landlord if you can you know you, you can call that you can call her a mom and pop landlord if you want to you know that would be an appropriate term according to the way they they like to use this terminology but this is not um uh you know and and people like that are can be in very real uh it can have a real, very real problem. I'm, I'm a mom and pop landlord. Actually, I should mention myself. I have a, I have a house uh, uh, that I've never lived in, but the, you know that I, you know, my mother is still alive and well, but she's passed on her, her house uh, to me in the countryside in, in Connecticut, and uh, you know, without, you know, getting into the details, the, the, the nice uh, fellow who lives there also can't afford the rent because, uh, like most of the rest of society, he's, he's, uh, you know, as low as the rent is, he can't afford it. You know, this is, uh, this is the way it is but uh and and you know people have to find ways of uh, coping with this situation and certainly lots of uh, mom and pop landlords are going to be losing their properties as well but uh we have to um understand that 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 is not uh that's the corporate landlords to talk about the mom and pop landlords don't have uh don't have the interests of the mom and pop landlords in mind. And there's all sorts of ways that we could, as a society, as a government, uh, could financially find ways to deal with this situation to allow the mom and pop landlords not to lose their properties. But I think we should also uh, we should also mention that these uh, that anybody who buys houses, and especially when we talk about these mom and pop landlords in the press, you know, you often find you know halfway down the article, you realize, oh, this is not just that they're renting one house; these people own five or six houses, you know, and uh, you know, okay. I guess they still qualify as mom and pop landlords, according to like IRS type of calculations. I mean, under this pandemic loan program, anybody with fewer than 500 employees is considered to be a small business. I don't know any small businesses that have 500 employees. That's a, it's not a small business. But um, there are, uh, they, but you know, these people that own five or six houses, uh, you can call them a mom and pop landlord i would call them a capitalist this is capitalism when you buy a bunch of properties and you hire a management company to manage it for you and you stay home and you don't work because you have a management company that has taken your inheritance which is most of the time you're talking about an inheritance you inherited money from your parents it was enough money that you did the smart thing and invested it in the real estate market because that is the most profitable place to invest you decided you're going to farm humans for a living. You're going to make money off of the need for human beings to have housing. You're going to treat housing as a right, not a privilege. And you're going to you're going to get people to rent in your houses. And if they can't af afford to pay the rent, you're going to get the cops to evict them. If that's your business model, screw you. You have no right to do that. You know, you should have your houses taken away from you and, and you can live in one of them. You know, that, that'd be a fine solution as far as I'm concerned. I have no sympathy for these so-called mom and pop landlords, unless we're talking about somebody who is actually more like a group house situation where you have a triplex and you you rent out one of the apartments. I mean, that's, you know, then it's a, that's a different kind. There are levels here, you know, and that, but uh, yeah, when you're talking about somebody who owns five or six houses, they made an investment. They made an investment that for many people over the course of the past decades has been incredibly profitable. They made an investment that might have been a good enough investment to send their kids to a private college. You know, and then they can complain, oh, we can barely afford to send our kids to Harvard. We're, 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 having, tr we're having such a struggle. We, we don't qualify for uh, scholarships. We have to pay full tuition because we're just not quite poor enough to require a scholarship. Uh, but we only make a few hundred thousand dollars a year. And wow, paying this $40,000 for our kid to go to Harvard. Oh, now we have three kids. They all go on to Harvard. And they're like, whoa, we spend $120,000 a year on their tuition. Poor us. Fuck them. <laughs> David, um, as we as we come to the end here, I do have um, one abstract question. As we look at the these these shutdowns continuing, round two is on in the offing. It looks like in different parts of the country and, and indeed parts of the world. 
Where do you, do you perceive that there are other agendas making hay while the sun shines with, um, with these social disruptions? And if you do, what, uh, what do you perceive uh, specifically? And in particular, do you detect a, a, a real move to get people onto a social credit score, a digital person merged with a legal person, and this type of um, thinking that we associate with the term technocracy? I think, uh, I mean, it's a really scary precipice we're on in so many different ways. And there's so many different uh, ways that things could go. It could go in that total like lockdown autocratic technocracy kind of thing where everybody has uh, every, every move is um, even more controlled and monitored than it was uh, a few months ago. Uh, and which is hard to accomplish. I mean, we were very controlled and monitored a few months ago and, you know, um, of course, you know, there's there's some pros and cons to everybody carrying around a video camera. It cer certainly has been able to expose police brutality a lot. And, you know, it's not all negative, but the, uh, you know, we there in so many ways, I think we, we can go in one direction or another. And it's hard to imagine just muddling it along and continuing the way we were going. I think things are going to be changing in one direction or another. We're either going to have uh, things are either going to move in a much more progressive direction or a much more fascistic direction. And I don't think there are other options that are realistic at this point. Yeah, you know, it's I don't think it's fair to say this is uh, in a sense what we're at now is like a end of the Roman Empire, beginning of the medieval, you know, in terms of gravity. But I don't think it's off on uh, off key to say this is something like the 16th century in terms of the shift from the medieval to the modern world. Only it's going to happen much, much faster. That's interesting. I I I uh, I must admit that uh, my my uh, it, my historical knowledge is is mostly limited to the to the nineteenth and twentieth centuries, and and so and and I and I'm, I'd be very interested in knowing about this comparison you're talking about because I'm often thinking about the eighteen forties, uh, <laughs> which, which I think is a really relevant period to what we're going through now in so many ways, particularly the eighteen forties in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, uh, but but that's probably because I've read a lot about the 19th century and and I think a lot about the 1930s as well, which in many ways in the 1920s in Italy and which I think is very relevant uh, as well. Um, but then again, also that's I think probably largely because that's the history I've I've read much about. But I hear people mentioning the English Civil War and and I and I don't I know nothing about the English Civil War, but it sounds like apparently that's really relevant to the current period too. I have no idea why. But like, why? What what happened in the 1600s? What's what? Can you can you uh, um, can well, we yeah. can we turn the tables here and you answer the question? <laughs> what, yeah. what what was going on then? I'm on your digital couch, so I must. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, well, the the idea. Um, so the parallel that I, I was making is um, in the abstract. That I'll give you specifics. Abstractly, is you have certain social structures both in the uh, the 16th century and now, which appear to me that people are in them, but they don't, they no longer believe them or they don't believe them as they were initiated. So for example, um, you had the feudal system in, which came about with the demise of the Roman empire for a very good reason. Um, and, and that's because of Vikings and, and banditry and so forth. So you had to, you had to cleave on to the, you know, the nearest strong man and over the years and centuries it developed and, and, and had its own problems, of course, but by the 16th century, there's no need, for, I mean, there's no need at all socially for the, the situation in the 8th and 9th centuries, which led to feudalism to develop. Right. But but there you were. You still had, you know, this with the 19th century, you still had people running around as lords and earls and dukes in the 19th century. Interesting. Um, but, but by the 16th century, you have social systems which have outlived their usefulness, but they're still there. And to make a modern parallel, I believe that's the case with the, the Western democracies in a large way, that the people who are in these positions no longer actually believe in the principles of the Enlightenment, for instance, of, of individual liberty and rights. And um, I mean, if you try to talk back to some of these cops about your rights on the side of the road, you, you, you'll soon as be tased as anything. <laughs> you'll find out what your rights are. Yeah. yeah. So we have we have this with education, of course, too. Um, uh, you know, you have these, you know, these star starry eyed guys like Horace Mann in the 19th century, you know, education for everyone and and broad expanses of knowledge and things. 
but you can't tell me if you walk into a, a school down the road that, you know, they, they believe anything of the initial fire that got the, the movement. I'm also aware of the industrial aspect, which you brought up too. I'm not gainsaying that, but um, you know, the, at least in the best possible light in the most idealistic sorts, that, that is not alive any longer except in, in statuary and posters on the wall. Mm -hmm. And so I see just a lot of, um, a lot of social institutions which have, um, they have many, many people involved in them, but their actual adherents are, are the, the, the true believers within those institutions aren't there any longer. So they have to snap just like institutions um, like the massive Catholic church or, or other institutions coming up like the state was in the in the 16th century, right? To compete with the church, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you have other things rising, which is my, um, I guess the parallel here would be just as you had the nation state rising in the 16th century, um, the the analog to that I would see as being like this, this whole digital world, which is, um, which seems to be coming into perception for me at least as, as I follow things. Um, one word you used in your, um, one of the analogies you mentioned about logging companies, just trying to, um, to sell off the product. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, I, I don't recall specifically the expression you used. Do you, I don't need it, but it would be helpful. Liquidating assets. Yes. Um, that almost seems to me like what's happening now in a lot of ways. Um, for instance, a lot of the, um, the churches here have shut down. Mm. Right. Um, I think. I, I, I think they're they're at the part, I think uh, schools will also do this, a lot of uh, colleges and things, that they're going to, both both of which, both communities um, institutionally were, you know, they were kind of living on the fumes of previous generations. Yeah. And I think now they're just going to literally go bankrupt and write everything off with reinsurance, um, you know, insurance and you have reinsurance behind that. Mm. Right. So I see a lot of these, these, seemingly megalithic things such as institutional education um or the state or the church um that they're massive socially you go everywhere you want to go david you'll see schools everywhere but because the spirit is no longer in these whatever got those things going that something else must replace them you can't just keep this zombie going like a uh, weekend at bernie's or whatever forever you know just <laughs> carrying on the corpse um, did yeah. I answer your question? Yeah, that's interesting. And yeah, certainly a lot of the uh, universities are already closing and were closing before the pandemic hit. And here in Oregon, I mean, in Portland, we've lost like two or three just in the past like couple of years. You know, they're clo the private colleges can't afford to function. And the ones that can function, as far as I understand it, the reason why, and I believe the only reason why many of them are really still functioning is because they are tapping the basically the global bourgeoisie for their student base. Yeah, yeah, because everyone here is tapped out. I mean, people are, you know, I, they've they've overplayed their hand here. All the all the uh, the middle class are are up to their their head with uh, student debt, and that even since two thousand eight, the enrollment into colleges has been going down. So yeah. that's an excellent observation you made. And it's easy to see, like where all, I mean, of course, you go to Harvard or MIT, and uh, what is it? I think one out of three students are from East Asia, and. And uh, and there are people who, who were some, some of the top in their class in China and other countries, and their parents are spending their entire life savings and spending uh, full tuition at Harvard in many cases. And this is that's a lot of students uh, that they are relying on from other countries who, to pay private tuition, which would in the universities I think would, wouldn't be able to function if they were only. Uh, accepting there's not enough uh, not of Americans who uh, whose families make enough money to pay full tuition at Harvard to populate that school full of qualified students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting times. That's that's for sure and certain. And if if another round of of closures, a real systematic um, round comes, which it seems to be the case, at least what I'm following here. It you know if if your business wasn't bankrupt before and if you weren't bankrupt before, you will be now. That's right. And they say, I think the Restaurant Association of the U.S. is predicting that 85% of restaurants across the country will be closing permanently by the time the pandemic is over. 
Yeah. Do you, um, as I, as I pick your brain here, David, and, and I won't belabor because you got to get on with your day and, and this and that, but, but do you perceive well, actually two things? Do you perceive that the state wants there to be unrest, social unrest for its ends for greater control? And then also that you bring up restaurants, um, has your reading um, brought up the, the reality of um, food shortages? Yeah, I mean, we're already, I mean, we're already in a situation because not because of food shortage, but because of stratification of wealth and, and the, the total broken nature of the employment departments in so many states and the fact that they don't cover so many of the unemployed workers, including, of course, undocumented workers and, you know, so many different reasons here in Oregon. I mean, I've been trying to get un unemployment for three months and never get anything but a busy signal. So it's just, uh, I mean, this is the situation for, for most of the gig workers in this state, which is 100,000 unemployed people last at last count. But yeah, it's, um, uh, there, the, there is already uh, hunger already, I think, uh, according to some mainstream press sources, we're talking about one in four kids going to bed hungry in this country right now. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so I think uh, definitely there are different elements of people in power in, in power or not in power who uh, can see the usefulness of un instability in society to further their aims, whatever their aims might be. But that can be true of uh, people like me who uh, want to see a more egalitarian society, a much more egalitarian society. Uh, and it can be uh, true for uh, people like uh, Trump who are clearly looking for an opportunity to institute uh, full-blown fascism in this country. And um, yeah, so in either case, uh, lots of instability can be potentially advantageous. I think uh, it is equally true that if there are riots every night in downtown Portland, that's going to uh, give the governor and the mayor some uh, second thoughts about uh, lifting the suspension on evictions, for example. Uh, you know, it's going to encourage them to consider uh, the the uh, demands that people are making to defund the police, for example, you know, but at the same time, uh, the, the, the riots going on every night in Portland, I'm not saying there are riots going on every night. I'm just saying that in the popular perception, uh, that's what's happening, right? <laughs> In the media, certainly that's what's going on. And uh, if that's going on every night, uh, then that's certainly also, as we can see in recent uh, statements Trump has made on national TV, you know, uh, this is a, a good uh, excuse for him to call in uh, more federal troops and to declare ultimately, you know, the, the kind of uh, fascism he's looking for. It's not enough. I mean, he needs a lot more instability in order to uh, get uh, some more sympathy for uh, his authoritarian uh, fantasies, uh, but either way, uh, instability can uh, feed, uh, you know, can feed things in either direction. I mean, you know, that there are those in power who who uh, don't want instability because they were they liked how things were, and and there's uh, those in power who maybe they liked how things were, but they'd like things to be uh, more unequal, and so instability is going to help them further their aims for uh, you know further inequality or more technocracy or more autocracy or whatever. You know, there's uh, lots of advantages potentially uh, that they can, you know, they, where they can take advantage of uh, instability, and and then it can also work the other way, where it can inspire, uh, you know, things like the New Deal, you know, which was also directly inspired by mass instability in society. So, David, where can we find out about your work and your website, your shows, and even in that happy uh, day, <laughs> your shows uh, in real life as well? Where, do you have websites and, and this sort of thing? Oh, yeah. DavidRovix.com. And people can all my music is up on all the streaming platforms. And uh, I broadcast every day. Uh, most of these days, most weekdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, I've been uh, broadcasting interviews with people as well as an open mic every Monday. And I have no shows uh, for actual physical audiences, uh, uh, because even if the even if it were advisable uh, you know, to do such things, um, even if they are going to be opening up venues at 25% capacity or whatever it is, you know, which hasn't even happened here yet. Uh, mm -hmm. but even if that were to happen, uh, you know, you can't, venues can't survive on 25% capacity unless they're being massively subsidized by the state and neither can performers. Mm -hmm. And the, the music industry it's worth noting was t in a total state of collapse 
before the pandemic. And, and that really started with, uh, with the rise of, uh, of the internet, uh, but but it, but it really increased really dramatically with when Spotify became a free platform. It cannot be overemphasized what what to what degree Spotify has single corporately uh, you know defeated uh, the global music industry that used to exist at both both the commercial and the indie music industry. You know, in one fell swoop, but uh, you know it is uh, the industry was in a state of collapse. So the idea that we could even survive on venues that are less than 100% full is a fantasy because we already lost half our income when CDs uh, stopped existing. And we already, most of us artists living in places like Portland have already seen our rents double and triple uh, since the time that CDs stopped being a thing, right? So, I mean, just, you know, just try to imagine why or how anybody is still doing music for a living. You know, if they are, it's because they're really, really famous or because they're totally subsisting on patronage like me. But otherwise, you know, People have gone and looked for other work, and you can see that in the in the IRS and the you know census statistics. Between one census from 2000 to 2010, there's 41 percent fewer people who claim to be musicians, like from in the professional sense. Not that there's fewer people playing music. There's more people playing music than ever, I think. You know, and that's great. But in terms of anybody making a living at it, it's really dismal. And it was before the pandemic. I can't imagine how anything is going to happen in terms of touring unless there's like, unless it's a tour of Canada or something that's got government subsidies or it's, uh, you know, after there's a vaccine that's been uh, passed out around the world. Yeah, you know, people, uh, David, use the term liquidating. It's not just liquidating capital assets. It's also liquidating culture. I really see that the powers that be are, are you know, they want everyone else to be, they want the whole world just to be on their um what do they call for children? What do they call this for children, David? You have three of them. What do you call the um like a the, the toy that you give the children? A play leapfrog, Device? a leapfrog, <laughs> like a leapfrog for everyone. That's uh -huh. it. Okay, yeah. I don't have that. I have, I'm behind the times. I don't know what a leapfrog is. Leapfrog is like um I, I don't know. It's it's one of those one of those game, gaming gaming devices, right? I only just learned what a switch is, oh. uh, and I want to get one because I want to play Animal Crossing because everybody else is doing it. So That's I'm a, I'm I'm not a technophobe. I mean I'm I'm scared of the technocracy, but I embrace the new technologies and I try to use them like you do, you know, as, to try to communicate with people for better or for worse, you know. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But these changes, in any case, are going just to hollow out culture, hollow out music until all we have. Yeah. Is Spotify and elevator music and, and whatever. And that's been going on for over a century. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Bingo. Well, I'm John Coleman, everyone. Um, I have on, uh, let's see, um, coming up on the 22nd and 23rd, I have two free webinars um, concerning the future of education, something which David and I talked a little bit about here. And those evenings are 7 p.m. each night, uh, Eastern Standard Time. The 22nd is for students in college, even grade school, parents, the general public. And then the 23rd are for uh, professional teachers, student teachers, administrators, and um, people who make a living off of teaching. So the topic is the same, the future of education. The audiences uh, are different on the two evenings. And if you're interested in that, please email me at Apocostasis Institute at AOL.com. And then I will send you the talking points so that you know what we're going to go over that evening. It'll be a private um, conversation, you know, in a group. And then also you need to email me so that you can get the link to get on the, the webinar. So um, with that, David, thank you so much for your time. And thank I you, hope John. to chat with you down the line. Absolutely. Take care. See you again. Thank you, David.